Now I'd like to introduce our guest host, Duncan Clark, publisher of Ottawa Magazine. Thank you both for your time today. And please take it away, Duncan. Thanks, Chantal, uh, and it's uh, great to be here. Um, I'll start with a quick uh, bio. Uh, uh, Jim Watson was elected mayor of the amalgamated city of Ottawa in 2010 uh, and re-elected for a third consecutive term uh, in October 2018. Uh, mayor Watson has dedicated most of his career to public service in Ottawa, uh, was first elected city councillor in 1991, again in 1994, uh, and became the youngest mayor in the history of the old city of Ottawa pre-amalgamation from 1997 to 2000. Uh, in 2000, he was appointed president and CEO of the Canadian Tourism Commission, uh, a position he held until 2003. Uh, after a brief, brief stint in media, from 2003 to 2010, he served as an MPP and minister uh, in the Ontario provincial government before returning to municipal politics. Um, Mayor Watson sits on several boards, including the National Capital Commission, the National Arts Centre, and Invest Ottawa, and has been recognized for his support of the tourism industry, uh, being named Ottawa's Tourism Leader of the Year uh, in 2012. In 2016, he was presented with the uh, Water Leader Award by Ottawa River Keepers for his persistent leadership to prioritize the city's efforts to clean up the Ottawa River. Uh, Your Worship, thank you for joining us today. My pleasure. Thank you, Duncan. Right. So, Mayor Watson, we have a, a lot we want to get to this morning, uh, and we also want to open this up to questions from the audience uh, later on, but I'll start with what I think is on everyone's mind. Um, got the word about 30 minutes ago, another 25 cases of COVID-19 in Ottawa today. Uh, middle of a bit of an alarming spike in numbers, 13 straight days and double digits. Um, how are you feeling about this right now? Well, obviously uh, concerned, uh, you know, happy that we have not had a death, I think, in about 30 days, which is uh, obviously good news. Uh, but, uh, you know, we're trending in the wrong direction. We should be in the teens or the tens, not the twenties in terms of cases. And, uh, you know, that's why we continue to work with uh, our community, our public health uh, officials, the great work of Dr. Vera Etches and her team, uh, Keith Aglai, the chair of the, of the uh, Ottawa Public Health Board, uh, to get the message across that uh, obviously COVID-19 is very much uh, alive and uh, with us. Um, and I think we cannot afford to become complacent because we've worked really hard to get our numbers down. We're one of the first municipalities to get into phase two and one of the first to get into phase three because of the good work that the community had done that social distancing and uh, wearing a mask and washing their hands and, and just being responsible citizens. So, you know, we uh, are seeing these numbers primarily as a result of people going to work uh, who are sick uh, or going to uh, parties at private parties, not so much uh, gatherings at restaurants and so on, although you know, that is a concern for us as well. So, you know, uh, Dr. Etches and I have a daily phone call that we talk about what needs to be done and we take your advice uh, and uh, implement it um, whenever and wherever possible. Has the tone of those conversations changed in the last couple of weeks since this has happened? Like how, how uh, have there been more conversations with Ottawa Public Health? What, what's sort of, what's changed uh, in terms of the communication? Well, you know, I think the last thing we, we need to do is to overreact or panic. Uh, you know, the, the numbers are too high, obviously in the 20s, the mid uh, to high 20s. We want to see those numbers go down. Uh, we're certainly uh, testing more people, which is a good thing. We want to continue to do that. I think that's one of the areas we need to get the province's support. We need to get more capacity at testing because people are waiting too long and that's, that's frustrating. And we have to make sure that we continuously get the results back within 24 to 48 hours. Otherwise, it, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to get tested and you don't get a result for a week as they're doing in the United States. And then you have that whole week of spreading the virus. Uh, that you don't know that you have. So we're not overreacting, we're not panicking, we're, we're working, for instance, uh, with the, the bar owners and the restaurateurs to go in the byward market. Uh, we don't want those places to become you know, sort of petri dishes of, of the virus because we have so many people jammed onto a patio. We have to respect social distancing. And I did some interviews today and said, look at if this continues and we see the problem emanating from areas like the Byward Market or too many people on a patio, then we'll have to take some pretty unpleasant steps and that includes you know, shutting down those patios that we made available free of charge to help the restaurant industry. And we may have to say, look at, you know, closing those streets has caused more uh, harm than good and we'll have to review that as well. So we don't want to go down that path. We want people to be responsible. And, and the message is, look at, uh, don't be selfish for yourself. You know, be concerned that you're actually bringing, potentially bringing the virus home 
to your loved ones, to your kids or to your grandparents or to other family members or office workers. So, you know, most people in Ottawa understand that it makes sense when you go into a shopping mall or a grocery store, you've got to wear a mask. And my just anecdotal visits around the city, I was in Orleans in the East End and did some tours and with other councillors over the course of the last couple of weeks. The vast majority of people are respecting the rules, which is great, but there are some outliers there that just don't feel that they have a role to play or to be responsible citizens. Yeah, I, I noticed on, you've done a great job sharing on social media, your sort of tours around Ottawa, talking to people. I think a lot of us, a lot of people uh, in particular, and we know that there's a trend towards COVID-19 cases being in younger people, uh, are influenced a lot by what they see on social media. And we see a lot of extremes on social media. People reacting very quickly and very dramatically at kind of, it's kind of what the platforms uh, uh, are, are suited to. I wonder what are the conversation, what are actual citizens who you talk to? And I know you're going to speak to people are different. If you own a business, if you run a store that's directly impacted by this, it's going to be different from people who are impacted by because their kids aren't in school. Like, what are, is, is there a, is there a trend in terms of what people are saying face to face with you about how they want to see this, this uh, dealt with? Um, well, certainly the parents that I run into are concerned about, you know, the uncertainty with respect to schools, when they're going to open and when they do open, how are they going to practice social distancing? Will the kids have to wear masks? What happens if one child or a teacher uh, is, is infected? How is that going to affect the rest of the school? So those are uh, decisions that the province has to make. And, and obviously we haven't heard exactly what, what those plans are. We've seen some evidence, certainly the local school boards are doing what they can. Um, you know, it, it's interesting because in, in the rural areas that I've visited with um, my colleagues, uh, Councillor El Shantiri, uh, as well as, as Councillor Scott Moffat and their, their rural wards, um, you know, there seems to be more of a self-reliant, uh, we're taking care of ourselves in rural Ottawa, there's more space, obviously, you know, sometimes you have a, a couple of kilometers between neighbours, uh, you know, in the farm country. Um, and, you know, a number of those businesses that we went to visit are actually doing very well. And then at the same time, um, I went to on a bike tour of Bay Ward with Councillor Teresa Cavanaugh and visited a number of businesses along Carling Avenue. Um, you know, some of them are struggling. There's no question about that. But uh, others have been very innovative. You know, I was in Vanier the other day at Louis Pizza on MacArthur, a very well-known establishment, been around, I think, 25 years. And in order for them to survive, because they had to close their seating portion and they just had delivery service or pickup, they have put these pizza kits together where they, they bring you the dough and they bring you all of the, the toppings and they put it in a pizza box and then you make it at home uh, with your kids or, or on your own. So, you know, they're, they're being innovative. Uh, we've got a lot of um, companies that uh, obviously have uh, pivoted from, for instance, uh, making vodka to making hand sanitizer in some cases, uh, some company in Stittsville making masks and shields for people. So people have been very innovative and creative, but there are some businesses that, you know, you, you just can't pivot to. You know, if you're if you're a uh, a restaurant, you're a restaurant. You can't you know, start doing something different. So you know, a lot of these restaurants have had a tough time, and that's why I think it's it's great that we were able to council support of my resolution that we waive the patio fees and uh, make it a lot cheaper for people to open a patio. And a good example of that is on Elgin Street, which is now after a year, two years of construction and really hard. Um, times for the people on that street. It's a beautiful new street, wider sidewalks. We've got trees uh, for the first time in a long time on Elgin Street. And uh, they've got a lot of patios. It brings a lot of life to the street. I think it, you know, I was just down Elgin Street just a few moments ago. I'm just looking out my window and I see it now. Uh, they're almost finished all of the brickwork outside City Hall and then it will be complete. And uh, it's made a big difference to have that life back on the street. Now, I want to get to a little bit more of that later on about some of the some of the changes to the city that have happened um, that maybe wouldn't have happened without this and, and what we can learn from it. But before we do get to that, uh, the other news that uh, has come out in the last couple of days, uh, Premier Doug Ford yesterday announcing uh, that $4 billion in, in federal and provincial funding will be distributed to municipalities uh, to help deal with revenue shortfalls uh, and increased expenditures because of, of the pandemic. Uh, we know the city of Ottawa is facing a $192 million deficit this year. Do we know how, what, how much of that is going to be is going to be floated to Ottawa? And, and even if you can't answer that, like what is it going to mean in terms of uh, the city's budget this year? Well, it's really good news. You know, um, my fellow mayors and I have been lobbying the federal and provincial governments, talking with the premier and prime minister and, and deputy prime minister and so on, uh, to get the message across that, you know, the, the original frontline uh, defense of COVID has have been the employees of 
municipal governments, the public health uh, nurses and doctors and officials, and, uh, bylaw people, police, paramedics, uh, water, uh, garbage, recycling, pickup, and so on. We've been providing these services despite the fact that uh, it's been a challenge, obviously. And we've also had the double hit of losing a significant amount of revenue. You know, transit ridership is a way down because people are working from home uh, or they've lost their jobs. Uh, we've got uh, no ice time rentals, swimming pool rentals, and so on, because for, for close to 100 days, over 100 days, we had no, no programs in those facilities. So you're right. So it's been 192 million, we estimate, that we will end up as a deficit by the end of this year. So we believe that uh, we'll hear within the next two to three weeks, according to the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing, uh, that we will hear our exact amount. A uh, portion of that will be transit, a portion of that will be other operating costs that we've heard. So that, uh, will, deal, that will hopefully deal with all of our costs, overruns, and lack of revenue uh, till the end of this year, which is our fiscal year. Because as you know, cities, unlike the province and the federal government, are not allowed to uh, run a deficit. So the, the devil's always in the details. Uh, we're the second largest city, so we assume we'll get the second largest amount of, of revenue from the province and the federal government, which is good. Uh, and secondly, uh, we need to ensure that we have a sustainable plan on a go-forward basis for 2021, because this solves our problem this year. But uh, as I understand it, the material I've seen, this is one-time money. Now, if everything goes back to normal on January 1st, and there's, you know, transit ridership is back up and you know, the recreation centers are, are filled with kids and their parents who paid the registration fees, then we'll be fine. I don't think that's going to be the case. I think we're going to deal with COVID well into 2021 and we're going to need continued support from the federal and provincial governments who have a greater capacity, obviously, because of their status in the constitution uh, to uh, raise money. Uh, we have one source of revenue primarily is property taxes and then you know, fees and fines and so on. And even those are down, you know, like people are probably happy they're not getting as many parking tickets. <laughs> but that also has a, an impact on our, uh, our bottom line as well, with the loss of millions of dollars. So I, I know, uh, you know, you're involved with that, the large urban mayors group and, and uh, you know, even during the lead up to this announcement, uh, uh, you know, there have been releases and discussions about those conversations. As with almost everything else to deal with, COVID relief, it feels like these conversations have been easier um, in between governments than they have been in the past. Uh, you know, how, how much of, how directly involved have you been? Would you agree with that? Uh, obviously you're nodding. It sounds like you do agree with that characterization. Yeah, you know, I, I think it's been, you know, you've seen the um, dysfunctionality in the United States, the governor of Georgia suing personally the mayor of Atlanta and the Atlanta city council and governors, you know, fighting with other governors and the president fighting with almost everyone. It's actually been completely the opposite here in Canada. There's been this sense of cooperation where you see the Prime Minister and the Deputy Prime Minister and the Premiers uh, working collaboratively, uh, working well and not going out and having a, a tantrum in front of the media if they don't get everything they want with that first set of negotiations. And I think you've seen a very respectful relationship between the mayors, uh, particularly the larger cities and uh, the leadership of the provincial and federal governments. You know, I. Uh, either chat or text with the Premier Ford probably once a week. I uh, have lots of contact with his ministers. Uh, Catherine McKenna, our local minister here in Ottawa, and Mona Fortier on uh, regular calls with them to, to keep each other abreast of what's going on. And uh, I can say nothing but very positive things about how you know, our relationship has been. Because the last thing I think that people want is some partisan squabbling because you know he's a Conservative Premier and a Liberal Prime Minister, Liberal Mayor, Conservative Mayor, or whatever. The reality is uh, we're all in this together. The whole country is affected. It's not one province that has COVID and everyone else is looking from the outside in. Everyone has this, the issues that we're dealing with. Some on a larger scale, you think of Toronto, Peel, uh, Brampton, those, those areas, uh, they're still not in phase three because their numbers are too high. So uh, I think, you know, the province has done a very good job. There's always going to be, you know, armchair quarterbacks and people, you know, in hindsight will say you should have done this and have done that. But you're going to walk a mile in these people's shoes. You know, they're under a tremendous pressure, uh, both financially and logistically. You know, think of the early stages of, of COVID. You know, we didn't have enough PPE, you know, uh, masks, and gowns and so on. And everyone, you know, put their, their shoulder to the wheel. 
we got that issue resolved. Needed more testing. Opened up, you know, we had one of the first test sites here at Brewer Park uh, in the entire province. Then we opened uh, one up in the sort of close to East End, South End. We've had mobile clinics go into, um, you know, economically challenged neighborhoods uh, as well. Uh, it's not perfect, but uh, I'm very proud of the collaborative approach that we've taken. You know, so the last time we spoke with you uh, at Ottawa Magazine was for uh, the issue that's out on the newsstands right now. That's about, that was about 60 days ago. So we had a good perspective on sort of where, um, where you were, your head was at and how you were feeling about things after 60 days. So it's 60 days later. And I wonder, like that's, we've been now been living with this for four months. Um, you know, what's, uh, I wonder what, what this experience has taught you. You know, one of the things we discussed in our last Q and A uh, is that, you know, you've you know, dealt with the ice storm, uh, you know, yeah, as the, as the head of the Canadian Tourism Commission, you dealt with 9-11. Um, you know, uh, so certainly, um, you know, sort of the unexpected uh, is something that you're used to. But I wonder, you know, this is, this is unlike anything we've ever dealt with uh, in our lifetimes. What, what has this taught you about yourself, about the city um, that, that comes to front of mind? Yeah, you know, you look at things like, like uh, the tornado um, that, that you know, devastated a large swath of, of an area of uh, West Carlton and the PN south end of the city and the flooding obviously that we saw in 2017 and 2019 uh the big difference of course is those events there's a beginning a middle and an end you know you know the tornado is gone and that's it the flooding will eventually recede with covid you just don't know when it's going to end you know whether it will end you know how successful the vaccine they started testing yesterday i know in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. so uh, it's the uncertainty and, um, you know we have a roadmap, but we don't know where the roadmap is taking us day to day. We have a pretty good idea, but we don't know when that roadmap is going to end. So, uh, you know, it teaches you to be patient and not to overreact and not to set your hair on fire if something has gone wrong. Uh, and also, it's taught me how valuable public health is. I had the honor of being the Minister of Health Promotion for a number of years, and I worked very closely with public health units across the province. And... Uh, they're uh, great resources for, for so many people, uh, but they've been a great resource to the entire community in terms of their wisdom and their messaging, and their social media outreach to, to individuals. So, you know, the big difference uh, from my perspective is uh, whether it's the ice storm or the tornadoes or, or the, uh, the flooding, is those are uh, events that affect it, you know, in some instances, just a small portion of the city and in other instances like the ice storm affected the whole city. But this is a phenomenon that's affected the whole world. And, uh, you know, there's nowhere you can go to escape COVID because as, as far as I'm, I'm aware, every country has had COVID cases, uh, some more than others, and some really devastating, as you were seeing in the U.S. You know, they opened too soon in Florida, and Texas, and California, and I believe they're paying the price now. So we, we had a lot of pressure put on us, you know, let us open our restaurant, let us open a patio. And we had to be the bearer of bad news, but it was the right thing to do because if we simply fold it to public pressure, um, we would be in a much worse situation. And we got lots of criticism, you know, for ticketing people that were in parks. Well, I think, you know, in a city of a million, I think we had less than a thousand tickets issued. So it wasn't as if we were going out trying to make a lot of money on, on these, these tickets. But after so many repeat offenses, when a barber shop was opening illegally or a spa or you know, people were having picnics in parks, uh, we had to send a message that this is a very serious health situation. And, um, you know, a ticket, is, it does sting, but it sends a pretty clear message. Don't go back and do that again because you're putting yourself at risk. And more importantly, you're putting the people around you that you love at risk. It's, uh, it's interesting that you say about, uh, about the uncertainty about how long this will last. I mean, I, I, we're all kind of existing in a world where uh, there's a bit of a new normal, but we, we think we know that it's not going to be the new normal forever, but it's going to create a different kind of experience at the end of this. That, you know, we're learning things, everyone's learning things about themselves and being preoccupied with things that they wouldn't otherwise have been preoccupied about. And I think something that a lot of people can relate to is just the notion that you know, there's so much to think about in terms of the way your life has been impacted that you you wind up sort of sitting awake at night, you know, with your mind on things you wouldn't have thought about. I wonder, is that the case for you? And like, what what is the? And, and I think it's it's not just about the things that you worry about, but also about trying to think about what's coming on the other side. I wonder, I wonder what 
what's, uh, what's, what's at front of mind for you when you sort of settle in at the end of the day and think about your experiences? Well, I, I think obviously of the, the potential for a second wave of COVID-19 and people becoming complacent, you know, they're back at work and, you know, they, they forget they should continue to wash their hands on a regular basis, uh, continue. Uh, you know, I know it's uncomfortable, but, you know, wearing a mask, um, a year ago, you know, you'd see the occasional person wearing a mask and, and I would have looked at them and said, it's weird, why are you doing that? Now, I think more and more people are wearing masks and will continue to wear a mask and it won't be looked at as sort of an odd thing to do. Be, you know what, that's the smart thing to do. So, the, you know, the, the potential for, for you know, a second wave concerns me. Our long-term care homes obviously are a big concern. You know, 70 to 75 percent of the deaths have resulted uh, from retirement homes and long-term care homes and nursing homes. And clearly, uh, we have to, as a society, do a much better job of dealing uh, with the tragedy that's taken place at these homes. You know, everything from people not being able to go and visit their loved ones to shared rooms to lack of air conditioning. And so I'm pleased the Premier has said that it's going to be an inquiry. But the reality is that uh, you know, these, these folks who are our loved ones, you know, parents and grandparents, uh, have suffered the most. And uh, we own four um, long-term care homes ourselves. We've lost um, uh, employees. Uh, obviously, we've lost uh, residents as well. And that continues to, to weigh on my mind in terms of what more can we do uh, on a go-forward basis. Have there any concrete steps taken towards that? I mean, obviously, this is a uh, this was an issue that wasn't just, uh, as you mentioned, it's not just Ottawa, it's not just Ontario. It's something that there were challenges across the entire country. Uh, you know, what's what have there actually been? What, what are have there been concrete steps that have been taken to think about how to prevent um, this from happening, not just in the immediate future, but in the long term? Yeah, we've we've obviously increased the staff um, component uh, to ensure that there's more help for individuals because obviously it's more labor intense now that. Meals are being brought to rooms as opposed to residents coming out to a common dining, dining area. Um, you know, we, we're actually, you know, the four homes we have are very well run, very dedicated uh, employees. And um, we thank them for their service because it's been tough for them because you know, they're seeing people that they become friends with passing away at a very high rate. Um, so, you know, we have to continue to work with them. I think our, our homes are in they tend to be newer than some of the, the other ones, so they tend to be in better shape. But uh, we certainly are doing our own uh, analysis in terms of what we have to do on a go-forward basis. And these are going to be some of the added costs that we have to factor into our budget as well. Uh, and then you know, there's the whole debate over the public and private uh, sector running these, these homes. Um, the lack of inspections at the provincial level obviously is a concern. So these are the kinds of things that you know, we're looking at doing now. We've implemented some changes, as I said, with greater staff, better PPE, and so on. But you know, we, we um, you know, obviously have let down a lot of these individuals because um, uh, you know, the virus gets in there and it spreads very quickly. We see the tragedy that took place in Almont and in the East End at Madonna and uh, some of the, the homes around the GTA where you know, dozens and dozens of people have lost their, their lives to COVID. So there are, um, you know, it's something you've noted uh, throughout this is that, you know, there are, just because we have a pandemic doesn't mean that the regular business of the city stops. Um, you know, there are dozens of initiatives, projects going on at any given time. Um, but because the pandemic is so all encompassing, um, you know, it, it, it's, it's, you know, it's a constant distraction for the right reasons, but it's still a distraction. Um, it does feel like some things like your road work has actually picked up. Um, I wonder, um, and that makes sense. There's fewer cars on the road. It's an it's a it's an unusual opportunity. Right. Um, is there any is, what is is there anything that comes to mind that's slowed down that's going to need to be picked back up again um, uh, because of this? Well, you know, a lot of the you know our uh, cultural institutions, for instance, you know our Ottawa Art Gallery, which I encourage your readers and viewers to go and visit. Um, it's uh, free of charge. It's a beautiful new relatively new facility on Daly Avenue just behind the Rideau Center. Uh, we've got to get people back into these these institutions, you know, the National Gallery open, the museums are starting to open, we lobbied hard to get those dates uh, pushed ahead for the simple reason that we uh, we need these, these draws to attract people to come back to the city. You know, tourism has taken a big hit, obviously, over the course 
course of the last four months. So, you know, uh, people who would normally be on a vacation uh, coming here to Ottawa, um, they're having second thoughts about traveling uh, any distance. And um, sorry, I've got allergies that have been really brutal <laughs> today. So that's why my nose is running. Um, you know, we, we need to uh, support the industry uh, because uh, the bulk of their funding comes from the municipal accommodation tax, which is a hotel tax. And if people aren't staying in the hotels, that revenue is, is plummeted. So the province uh, certainly has brought uh, forward uh, funds, uh, which is helpful. Um, we continue to be very supportive. We have uh, regular uh, conference calls with an economic task force that, that I set up uh, shortly after COVID arrived in our city. It's made up of the presidents of Ottawa Tourism, the Festival Network, uh, the BIA Council, um, uh, the Big Group des Jean d'Affaires for the Francophone Community, the Board of Trade, uh, the film office, um, the music industry, and so on. How we can work collaboratively, you know, through our passport program that we launched to get people to do staycations uh, or to encourage people in that corridor between Toronto and Montreal and Kingston that may want to take a one or a two day trip to come and visit some of the, the uh, special places here in the nation's capital. So uh, they've worked well together with the city. We've had a really good collaborative uh, working uh, relationship. We developed a business toolkit uh, that allows people to open up their businesses that the tourism industry of Ontario uh, copied. And we've had other municipalities ask for our permission to use it. It's available at Ottawa.ca. And it gives all of the different programs that are available for financial assistance, for instance, from the federal government, and what you need to do to sort of reopen your restaurant or, or so on. So, um, you know, we've, we've done what we can on the economic front. We can't uh, provide direct financial assistance, but we can offer, you know, a break on patio, for, uh, patio deals and so on. We've also um, uh, allowed people to defer their property taxes, both business and residential. Instead of the payment in June, it's now in October. And so we've had, I think, close to 2,000 applications for that. That's helping with cash flow for those, those individuals. And then we also have a human needs task force that is dealing with uh, the most vulnerable in our society, the homeless, who need to self-isolate. We've opened two centers, uh, Routier Community Center, for instance, in Lower Town, where uh, we've set up facilities along with the, the Jim Durrell Center and Alta Vista, acting as a, as a hostel so that you know, People are not confined to cramped quarters at our shelters. Um, you brought up uh, tourism, and uh, I wanted to follow up on that a little bit. Uh, you know, you have that background that I mentioned off the top as the president CEO of the Canadian Tourism Commission, and you were in that role uh, when 9/11 happened. Which uh, you know, we know, um, you know, I'm a member of my family who's uh, in the travel industry, owns a travel agency, and um, you know, the impact on that entire industry is is substantial. Um, you know, as someone who has been through a, a tremendous disruption in, in the tourism and has been in a leadership position, outside of the collaboration you're talking about, which I'm sure is a huge part of the solution, you know, assuming that we do have a, another side of this where there's a vaccine and, 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 you know, I think there's a lot of speculation that people are going to be hesitant to travel soon. You know, what, do you have any sort of, uh, from your experience, any ideas about what we can do both as a city, but also as a, just a country and a, a, to, to bring tourism back uh, in, in, uh, in a way that it needs to be to, to support the economy? Yeah, I think, you know, Ottawa is in a, in a relatively good uh, position to restart the economy. And we have um, our biggest uh, labor force, our federal public servants, and by and large, uh, they continue to work, uh, many from home, continue to, to get a paycheck. We have a large group of retirees from the federal public service that have a, a, an income through their pension. And these things are, we're going to draw on these folks to help uh, kickstart, you know, the restaurant business, uh, the, the whole concept of staycations, getting people to visit uh, different parts of their, their own city that they've never visited before. You know, I uh, went to um, not too far of a field, a Wakefield last week, you know, and stayed at the Wakefield Inn, which is, it's not in Ottawa, but it's part of the national capital um, region. And uh, they were having a really good uh, season. It, they told me 70, 75% of their business is from, actually from Ottawa. So we need to get people from Gatineau and from Montreal to come and visit our facilities and, and vice versa. Uh, we need to ensure that more of our institutions are open, you know, like the, the museums that draw kids and families uh, to the national capital region. 
Uh, we need people to go out and, and, and visit rural Ottawa. We've established, you know, a, a rural cycling program. Information is available at ottawa.ca where people can go out and, and cycle. You know, we've got four wineries in Ottawa. We've got, you know, I think, a dozen breweries. We've got some amazing uh, attractions like the Diefenbunker in Carp or the Cumberland Museum uh, in the East End. We've got the Ottawa Art Gallery in the downtown core. So there's lots of things for people to do. It's not, you know, going to Disneyland or it's not going, you know, on a plane trip to Paris or somewhere in Europe. But I think now is the time to stick a little closer to home. But, you know, those what we call one tank visits, one tank of gasoline to come from Montreal or to Toronto. Um, Ottawa is the perfect location. We've got via service, obviously we've got air service uh, and uh, you know, we've got uh, good roads to get people uh, in and out of the city. How concerned are you about the airport? I mean, the numbers are staggering. Uh, uh, I'm someone who flies on a regular basis and to see the number, uh, it, there's about as many people coming through uh, the airport in a month uh, as used to come through in a day. Uh, and that's in the middle of a, an important renovation. Um, like there's gonna be a significant shortfall there. Uh, how concerned are you about that? Well, very concerned. You know, I have great confidence in Mark LaRoche. He's, he's a great president and CEO and he's having to juggle because of course a good portion of their revenue obviously comes from um, you know the airport improvement fee that, that every ticket holder pays uh, through their airline ticket and uh, you know they have very very exciting and ambitious plans in terms of the whole renovation the hotel that's going to go there the Germain hotel uh, the LRT station that's being built as, as we see it so you know work continues on these projects uh, which is good you know phase two of LRT for instance is creating Actually, thousands and thousands of jobs. That work didn't stop. There's been some delay from time to time because you know uh, equipment and, and supplies coming across the border are taking a little longer. But it's been a, a godsend to help keep the construction industry uh, really um, working uh, nonstop. You mentioned um, the, uh, the construction on thing. You know, I was down on Montreal Road in Vanier. It's really a lot of pain for the. the um, financial pain and worry for the, the owners because you've got all this work that's being done, but it's a classic example of short-term pain for long-term gain. That street will be sort of a beautiful, inviting street for people to go on. Elgin Street is another good example of that, where it's, you know, we've taken the street and, and you know, rehumanized it. We'll do the same with uh, Albert and Scott because the buses are gone. You, know, you can never have a patio on Albert and Scott because of all the diesel fumes of the buses. And you look at the work we're doing in the airport parkway, Riverside Drive, getting all resurfaced as well, because you know, we've had so many bad winters of freeze-thaw that the, the number of potholes was just unacceptable. So, you know, going back to the airport, the airport is a big economic uh, hub in our city, it creates a lot, lot of jobs, creates a lot of economic activity, and uh, we need to get people back flying again. And, um, you know, that's going to take some time because I think people are still reluctant um, to get on an airplane with the circulating or the lack of circulating air. Uh, but at some point, um, you know, people will get back to more of a normal routine, which will mean that they have to travel. You know, a lot of people have suggested, you know, well, we won't have as many conferences and conventions and so on at the Shaw Center because people have realized they can meet virtually. I think people are tired of meeting virtually. They want to interact with other human beings. You know, I think in some ways, uh, the Zoom and, and Skype and FaceTime uh, experience, while it's helped us, uh, it's really tired us out. And we actually want to go to a convention. We want to go to a conference. We want to have working meetings here in the boardroom or at the Shaw Center or in the hotel ballrooms and so on. And that will get people back, you know, flying again, uh, taking the train. But it's, um, you know, it's obviously a concern. And, and uh, you know, every airport in the country is facing the same dilemma that we are. Uh, you know, we've got a really exciting series of plans. Uh, they're continuing the work on the terminal, as, as I, I'm told, and uh, the, art, the LRT station is, is under construction as well. It will attach right to the, the terminal, as will the hotel. So once that project is completed, it's going to really put us in another level in terms of uh, service to the public and to the traveling public. Um I want to get back to, uh, you know, we, you talked a little bit about Elgin Street and the new patios out there. There were patios everywhere. You mentioned that you supported the, um, uh, you, you proposed the initiative to waive patio fees for this year. I mean, 
Um, I think, you know, I'm, I'm in the Westboro area, area of the city, the new patios that are popping up along Richmond, along Wellington. Um, I mean, these are, uh, th these are adding to the vibrancy at a time when you really need it. Um, you know, the, there are quality of life things that have come because we've needed to relax regulations or change them that have really, you know, are, are things that feel like they, it's a kind of thinking that could perhaps last long term. I wonder, has we, have you or has the city learned something about pace? about how fast things can get done um, if, uh, if, if, there's, uh, if there's enough of a, of a, a movement towards it? Yeah, I think you've seen you know, uh, examples of that. The, the approval of the patio process, for instance, was sped up uh, pretty dramatically. It was one of the projects that I, I worked on because I saw the benefit that you know, restaurants couldn't allow people inside. So what can we do, at least in the short term, during the good, good uh, months of, of good weather? to get these approved. So, you know, I certainly met with our economic development staff and give them full credit for working very hard. A lot of the BIAs, for instance, you know, a good example is on Somerset Street, that, that section basically between Bank and I guess O'Connor with all those great restaurants. Uh, they put, you know, money down to close the street uh, and it's working really well. And uh, we've, we've seen that time and time again. So, you know, those jurisdictions, you know, the credit is really uh, reserved for the BIAs for the volunteers and the restaurateurs that are actually making it work. The government, you know, through the city, was able to work you know, in a collaborative fashion to get the barricades uh, to them and so on. But, you know, I think it's, uh, it's those individuals who, quite frankly, without the patio revenue, probably would have gone bankrupt by this time. Yeah. So, is that, I mean, maybe this sounds too simple, but is there, has there just been a greater spirit of collaboration from this? Is that what needs to be taken in order, like, I mean, I wonder if, if you know, the, the amount of time that the city is spending getting feedback or, or taking uh, suggestions from BIAs and from private business owners, it's, has that increased in, in this time of need? And is that something that can be carried forward? Well, we're, we're certainly getting a lot of, of positive feedback, you know, on the work that our economic partners task force, because we have the chair of the, um, I'm sure if we have to push this here, I think I just got cut off there. Whoops, there we go. Sorry. You still hear me there, Duncan? Nope, that can be just fine. <laughs> just went blank for a minute. Um, okay. You know, we, we had um, we the Council of BIAs, which is a council that I helped form a few years ago, where we have all the BIAs meet on a regular basis, and, and their chair, uh, Mark, who does a great job from the Vanier BIA, um, is the chair of the council. And uh, one of the things that we've done, for instance, is we launched very early on a buy local campaign, encouraging people to go and buy gift certificates and gift cards and so on to these restaurants and services. Uh, I went out and bought, I think, seven different gift cards from different restaurants uh, in different parts of the city that I like going to, uh, to give them some help from a cash flow point of view. And uh, they've been very appreciative of that. We've got some good videos. We've got lots of downloads uh, uh, in terms of um, access to the, the website and so on. So, you know, listen, it hasn't been perfect. Uh, there's lots of... Um, errors that, that have been made along the way, but I believe that our staff and the public service here at the City of Ottawa have really risen to the challenge and have worked collaboratively uh, with um, our, um, our partners who are, are struggling. Um, uh, I want to, uh, so just a reminder to the audience, uh, we are gonna take questions from the audience in the last uh, 10 or 15 minutes of this talk. So if you have questions, please get them into the chat um, and they'll be added uh, to the list. Um, I want to move on to I mean, a big part of the future of any city is um, is people feeling uh, like they're at home um, and a challenge that all society has been facing across North America uh, recently has been um, a, a renewed focus on systemic racism, um, uh, the, the, uh, the killing of George Floyd uh, in Minneapolis uh, triggered that attention as well as other events both uh, here in Canada and uh, in the US and internationally. Um, you know, I, I, want to, I, I want to have a bit of a conversation about how our few, you know, the future of the city is, is tied to our ability to tackle this problem. You know, I, I want to start with, I know you, you, know, you attended um, uh, the march uh, on Parliament Hill in, in June, um, as did the Prime Minister, as did many others. Uh, can you tell us about being there and, and what that meant to you? Yeah, you know, it's one of these sort of damned if you do, damned if you don't as a politician. If you don't show up, you don't care. If you do show up, you're just there for a photo op. So I, I went um, very much... Uh, as mayor, but also as a, a citizen, uh, to express my uh, anger and frustration at what had happened with Mr. George, but also recognize that we have uh, 
uh, serious uh, systemic racism problems right here in our own backyard. And we can't sort of just gloat at you know, what's going on in the United States and think that we're doing all right. You know, what we did you know, months before the killing of uh, Mr. Floyd was we established on the recommendation of my colleague, uh, uh, Ralston King, uh, an anti-racism secretariat uh, that is now staffed and uh, up and running. Uh, we appointed um, uh, Ralston as our council liaison on anti-racism and ethnocultural um, issues so that he will work with members of council and the community to come up with ideas and plans on how we can continue to be a better society and uh, treat everyone with respect and, and dignity. So we've actually taken some concrete steps that uh, I'm very proud of, but obviously we need to do more. You know, I was on the police service board uh, a call last night. Our board meeting is, is done through Zoom as well. Uh, and, um, you know, the, the chief, our first black uh, chief uh, in the history of the city of Ottawa, who was hired nine months ago, is doing some remarkable work to deal with some of the real challenges of systemic racism within uh, the police department, for instance. So uh, this is going to be um, a longer uh, term issue to, to resolve. We're not going to resolve racism overnight with a poster campaign. It's going to require us uh, changing the way we, we do things. You know, a good example of that is, you know, the police force right now really does not reflect the face of, of Ottawa. And, uh, we need to do a better job in that, for instance. Um. The uh, policing in particular has become a strong focus because of the nature of Mr. Floyd's uh, killing um, and, uh, you know, the, the, the entire concept of policing as we know it has been, has been challenged in, in recent months. Um, you just mentioned those. How, how are those conversations changing? Uh, and and I, I also wonder about, um, you know, policing and, uh, you know, just people's, people's own um, situations are changing so much because of the pandemic. I wonder if that's being taken into um, account in those conversations. Yeah, it, it's, you know, the, the whole issue of, of systemic racism is coming at a, a challenging time because, you know, um, we've got, you know, this immediate concern of people dying as a result of the pandemic. And then you've got uh, you know, concern, obviously, of you know, racialized communities uh, feeling that they are being targeted. You know, we're seeing more of that U.S. obviously with the mass protests that are taking place, um, you know, surrounding um, you know almost a daily occurrence of what appears to be a brutality by police officers towards uh, mostly black men in the United States. So you know, I, I'm very confident that uh, we have the right chief at the right time uh, who is putting forward a, a plan. And one of the reasons why, for instance, I don't support defunding, and, and the chief brought this up as a very good point yesterday is that you know, one member of council wants to defund the police by $50 million. I don't know where that number came from, probably thin air. So $50 million means that the chief will not be able to hire the numbers of new police officers. And what he'll have to do is basically let go dozens, if not hundreds of police officers. Well, as you know, the last couple of years, we've been working really hard to get more uh, visible minorities, more women, more members of the GLBTQ community to apply as police officers, they'll be the first ones laid off, which will set us back even farther. So, you know, to simply say we're going to go and cut $50 million out of the budget, the biggest harm will be to those racialized members of the police service and, and female members whose numbers have been going up in the last couple of years of hiring. It'll set us back tremendously. And I don't think that makes any sense. And we see the the number of calls that are required. Yes, we, we need to do a better job in terms of dealing with mental health calls because the police are not, not equipped to do that. But I don't think you harm one organization by trying to help another organization. The police do a very important job and uh, we need to support them. But at the same time, we, we can't stand back and say everything is, is going well. There are clearly issues of race and racism in the department as there is at City Hall, as there is in the corporate community. Um, before I turn it over to audience questions, uh, it's hard to talk about the future of Ottawa without thinking about the biggest investment in the future of Ottawa, certainly of, of the of recent years, which is the LRT. Um, you know, when we talked to you a couple of months ago, uh, you talked about how we've taken the opportunity of, of lessened ridership to, to try to um, deal with some of the issues that plagued um, the new line uh, prior to the pandemic. Uh, it sounded like we were getting ahead, then we had cracked wheels, then we had 
uh, communication issues. Uh, you know, we have warped tracks. I wonder if you can if you can just give us an update on where things stand, uh, and and then really what riders can expect um, when you know when when ridership's back up to one hundred percent, which is hopefully very soon. Yeah, I think you know uh, since that last conversation, we've had a change in leadership. Uh, Mr. Louch has left the organization. We have two new individuals who've taken over presidency of RTG and RTM. RTM is the maintenance arm, and RTG is the overall uh, contractor. Uh, and uh, I had a meeting, a Zoom meeting, just a couple of days ago from from our senior staff, and they are uh, more optimistic in terms of the work that's being done now to deal with some of these issues um, you know and we've said look at if you need us to shut down on the weekends and replace it with bus service or shut down for a, a week at a time to get these issues resolved and they've taken us up on, from a, on occasion with that that offer because as you know uh, the train service runs almost around the clock there's a very short window of opportunity basically between one in the morning and, and five in the morning so um, you know our number one objective is to bring reliability back to the system, bring bring it to the system. We haven't had it for, for some time. You know, we've had a couple of uh, weeks in a row where there's been good service, and then, you know, we get another problem that confronts us. So, you know, I'm not satisfied. That's why we're, we're holding back uh, their funding on a monthly basis, so it's hitting them in the pocketbook. And I had a conference call with the presidents of all of the consortiums from Paris to New York to Toronto, uh, and laid down my expectation that when we get back up and running with schools back and more people coming back to work in September, that we have to have as flawless a system as possible. We'll never have a 100% system. No system can, can deliver that. When I lived in Toronto, you know, every week I'd hear of some, some reason the shutdown was taking place in the Finch line or the Shepherd or, or whatever. Uh, but we have to expect much greater reliability. And I can tell you, you know, I take the train as, as often as I can. When the train is working well, it is a really good system. It's people on and off. When it is not working well, it's a horrid system. And people are frustrated. The platforms get too um, crowded. Um, people are late for work, late for medical appointments. And that's not what we paid for. So, you know, um, this is not rocket science. This is running a train system. We will get this and we'll get it done right. And we'll make sure that we... Uh, hit the ground uh, running in, in September and October and November so that we bring the confidence of the public back that we've lost, quite frankly, and I don't blame them. Are you confident that the lessons that are being learned now in stage one are being applied in advance to stage two? I know there's differences in the, in the, the trains and in the nature of that line, but clearly there will be some similarities and those lines have to work together from a, a ridership point of view. Absolutely, and, you know, and it's in the best interest of the consortium to make sure that they, they learn the lessons from, you know, whether you know, the, the, the switch system, for instance. The switch system solution could have been resolved a year ago, but there was a sense of stubbornness on the part of RTG that they weren't going to prepare the proper gas lines to heat the switches. So uh, it was done by electricity. Electricity was not enough for some of the, the switches, and you had all of the switch issues which backed up the whole system. So they've now agreed to... Uh, install gas lines uh, like they do in most other systems and that will be the standard on phase two so yes lessons will be learned and they'll be brought forward because uh, the consortium whether it's uh, the old or the new don't want to go for months on end without getting paid you know that's the, you know, the, the stick we have is is money and uh, we're not going to pay them unless they meet the criteria laid out in the project agreement and as john manconi said they're They've had some periods uh, this past uh, couple of months. Granted, it's been lower ridership and, and fewer trains, but that they will probably qualify for some months of, of support over the course of the next several months. But nowhere near what they are expecting because we're not going to pay them for a service that is substandard. Thank you. So I'm going to, um, we've got 10 minutes left. I'm going to jump into some audience questions now, if that's okay. Uh, we actually got one in advance, which is, uh, which was, uh, we run these uh, fairly often, and uh, it's a good sign that there's a lot of interest. We get questions in advance. Uh, this question coming from Nancy. Uh, will Ottawa continue to close streets to give pedestrians and cyclists more room to safely enjoy the city? Well, we've done that in some instances, um, but in other instances, uh, there hasn't been either the community support. You saw, you know, there was quite a, a 
a dust up uh, with the lead BIA and the local councillor in that area. Uh, whereas we saw another example in uh, Councillor um, McKenney's ward, where Bank Street on Saturday, that seems to be working very well, and, and Somerset as well. And then in the Byward Market, aside from the crowding issues, we proposed those. I'm a member of the NCC board and uh, supportive of the NCC closing the parkway. So we actually do have a number of, of streets that are closed for certain periods of time. Uh, there are other streets uh, that uh, there are challenges because, um, you know, obviously there are major bus routes that go through certain streets and we need to ensure that they continue to, to operate because they, tr they transport a lot of people. So, you know, I think we've got a fair number of streets. There are other people that want more streets. I know, for instance, uh, you know, a good example is in, on Byron Avenue, uh, Councillor Leeper, um, you know, using his uh, infrastructure budget or his traffic calming budget, closed down Byron Avenue from, I can't remember from what street to another, uh, and it's working really well. Uh, and then Councillor Cavanaugh tried a pilot project in another section of Byron near my street, and it didn't work so well. So I think it's a bit of a test, you know, to see if it works. Um, you know, Councillor Leeper, for instance, chose to close Byron, which is a less frequent street than the parallel street, Richmond, uh, which would have caused, I think, some some frustration on the part of restaurants and shops that offer curbside service and the buses that go down uh, Richmond Road. So it's all about trying to find the right right fit. Um, there have been some uh, critical of me because I've insisted that the councillors have to find the money. Well, we're losing a million dollars a day at the City of Ottawa, and I think it's not unreasonable that uh, if someone wants to close a street, they have to find a funding source for it. So in the case of Bank Street, it's the BIA paying for it, which is good. In the case of uh, Clarence Street, it's the Markets Administration. And in the case of, um, uh, of uh, Byron Avenue, it's the, the Ward Councillor's um, traffic calming budget, which is intended for these kinds of initiatives. Uh, Amir Watson, hockey in a lot of people's minds right now, uh, the NHL uh, starting exhibition games today and uh, starting uh, real actual games on August 1st. Unfortunately, the, the Senator is not participating in this. Um, a question from Jonathan, uh, though, can Ottawa support an NHL franchise? Is this a city that can do this in the long term? Absolutely. You know, I think um, we've obviously had uh, a rough couple of years. You know, there's been lots of frustration on the part of the fans towards management and, and, and Eugene Melnick. And obviously, if the team doesn't play well, then obviously the, the numbers of people going to the games. But you look at, for instance, the success of the 67s. They were having an, an amazing season. Uh, and then, of course, it had to get shut down and they were doing really, really well. Um, you know, we have, um, you know, I think the NHL has done a really good job, for instance, uh, knock on wood, uh, that they haven't, you know, they've had the bubble system. They've got the two centers in, in Edmonton and, and Toronto, and they haven't had one case of COVID-19, whereas you compare that to uh, the NBA and baseball, I think the Florida team, you know, had 16 cases, you know, uh, just in the last day or so. So, you know, Ottawa is a population now of a million. When you include Gatineau, it's 1.3 million. We really need the arena to move downtown. That is going to be the long-term solution to the viability of the franchise. Uh, and in the interim, we need um, the ownership of the team uh, to ensure that they're more in tune and in touch with the fans and treat their fans uh, better. And uh, you know, we need to get those, uh, as I say, bums and seats because you know, last year, lots of uh, empty seats at the CTC and we don't want to lose the franchise. It's too important to the economic well-being of our, our city. But we've seen, you know, these skirmishes, you know, the, you know, the fight between the foundation and the ownership. And, you know, the, the uh, fight between Eugene Melnick and his partner with the Labreton redevelopment. We've got to get those things behind us. And, uh, you know, as part of the NCC, I insisted that we carve out an area of the revitalization and redevelopment of Lansdowne for the equivalent size of an arena. So we may not have a deal now, but we don't want to lose that space, create park space for the time being. And then if we have either an owner with a change of heart or a new owner or the NHL steps in and they say, you know what, the success of, of the Senators is downtown located between the Pimacy LRT and the Bayview LRT to get people in and out. You know, just think of it for a minute. When you're out at, uh, if you have an office, you, you park downtown at, 
World Exchange Center and you have a parking spot and you want to go and uh, see the, the hockey game or have dinner before, you just go down, walk across the street, there's the LRT station, you know, have rest, have a meal at a restaurant in center town and then hop back on the train over the uh, Pimacy station and you walk literally to the front door of the, of the arena. Uh, and then you come back and you, you know, take the train to your office and then your, your car's still in that parking spot. You don't need 20,000 parking spots uh, for that arena because you have that great connectivity with the uh, trends. This, of course, the exact uh, situation in Calgary, which is, uh, has struck a deal in a new arena with, with public funds. Um, and uh, uh, I guess, uh, and, you know, they're, they're just moving the arena across the parking lot, but it's the exact same scenario with the LRT. Is there a scenario where public funds uh, would be considered for something like that if you're, if, uh, you're still sitting in that chair? Uh, from my perspective, no, we shouldn't put public funds into the building of an arena. Uh, we will be a partner in the Liberal in Flats because there's going to be parkland and we'll be responsible for maintaining the parkland. That's part of the responsibility of, of a, a municipal government. Uh, but I don't believe in directly subsidizing um, you know, a, uh, a sports franchise. Uh, the difference, you know, some people will say, well, what about Lansdowne Park? Well, Lansdowne, we own the land and it will revert, revert back to us. And uh, it is you know, public land that you know, is being used, you know, the, the Great Lawn and the Aberdeen Pavilion, the Horticulture Building, those are all under the control of the city. So, you know, I think there's um, lots of, of things that, that can be done, for instance, to make it uh, attractive for fans to go to Le and Flats. Uh, you know, we have a really great deal with the 67s and uh, the Red Blacks, where your ticket is your bus ticket or your train ticket. We should do the same thing with the Senators, for instance. So, you know, you add on that fee so that everyone you know, is encouraged because they've already paid for it, use transit to get to the arena as opposed to driving you know, your car. And then the other problem is, as you know, there's, there's literally no walk-up traffic at the Canadian Tire Centre. No one lives within walking distance of the CTC. There are thousands of people already that live within walking distance of the current Le Breton Flats, and there'll be thousands more with all of the development that will take place there will be, I think, a boom uh, for that part of the, the downtown core. And, and, you know, the library is being built uh, just across uh, from Le Breton. It will actually be the first Le Breton project that we break ground on next year. So that's pretty exciting. So Tom, one final question uh, coming from uh, Nicholas. Uh, could you comment on the future of Ottawa Gatineau transportation and issues like a possible new automobile bridge or integration of light rail systems? Yeah, I, I don't support another um, bridge, uh, particularly at Kettle Island. It will eviscerate a large number of communities. Um, we put forward a proposal to do an environmental assessment on a, a tunnel coming off the bridge uh, down King Edward and, and out at Coventry to get the, the big uh, trucks, the 18 wheelers, the lumber trucks, you know, trying to go always go downtown and turn right at the liquor store at at um, Rideau and then a quick you know, left on Waller and jamming up the downtown core with the fumes and the, and the danger of those trucks. That was not accepted. So uh, we're working with uh, the city of Gatineau and they're out doing public consultation now, for instance, uh, for their light rail transit project that would uh, see them coming up the Portage Bridge and either using Wellington or going underground under Spark Street. Uh, I think that's a, a wiser investment to get people who work in Ottawa to get no quicker and more efficiently and vice versa, uh, integrating our LRT system. So you know, the LRT would drop people off, you know, perhaps at the Lion Station, maybe at, at Elgin, and then they'd hop on our system if they have to go farther east or you know, hop on uh, and go towards Bayview if they have to go south to, uh, to get the, uh, the O train, from the line. Okay, with that, we've hit noon. Uh, and so uh, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to end here by saying you've given us a tremendous amount of your time and we thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, and uh, wish you, of course, all the best as, uh, as we continue to go through uh, these challenges we're going through together. Thanks very much, Mayor Watson. Great. Thank you.